Good morning. How's everybody doing this morning? Man, the Dr. Block and all the stuff there, uh, just Love Your Neighbor Week was absolutely incredible. Just incredible people just loving and pouring into our community and neighbors and some incredible stories as connections and friendships and relationships built, just kind of build bridges of serving so we can share the gospel continually in the future. And then also last week, just incredible Easter services. And that was only possible because we have some amazing, amazing volunteers and champions, including uh, Ben Heinkel and Tommy Alexander and James Howard and Mike Curtis and Denise Curtis and Yolanda Heinkel. Get this whole stage set redone within a week's time. And so give them a big round of applause real quick. And then tons of other people serving and greeters and ushers and parking lot and, and chapel kids and six, seven, eight youth and just across the board. It only happens because people love their church and want to see the gospel presented in a kind of way. So I want to say thank you from the bottom of my heart. Uh, also, next Sunday we have water baptism. We'll talk about it in just in a second. But next Sunday night from 4 to 6 p.m. is our baptism after party. It's an all-church event for everybody. And the reason for this is to help try to get you to build some connections and relationships with your church family. So thank Church Picnic Free food, there'll be inflatables for the kids, games for adults, music for our senior adults, the whole nine. So bring a lawn chair and a chair and come hang out from 4 to 6 p.m. next Sunday night. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2. You know, I, tr- I travel somewhat quite a bit, more than I probably like to. And I think it was London Twin. I went to London in the fall to the Alpha USA conference. Alpha started in London, but also the Renaissance conference. Just incredible to see what God is doing in Europe across the board. Toya flew with me, so she didn't always fly international with me. And when she did, like, it, it's interesting because, like, I'm used to the routine. And we I always get, because I'm tall, I don't want to pay extra money for first class. So I always get the bulkhead seat, which is close to the restrooms, right? So I'm, I'm long. I want to be able to stretch out my legs. Well, I look up, and Toya is gone. She asked the flight attendant to change seats because we're too close to the bathroom. She don't want to smell or see people using the restroom the whole way to London. And so I'm like, I don't know if we're having marriage problems. Like, what's going on? Like, she's just moving around. And, and the flight attendants always give you this safety brief, right? And so you can tell who flies a lot by who pays attention to the, the safety brief because this is the worst case scenario. They don't tell you the good stuff of flying on an airplane. They tell you the worst possible scenario that could happen. So the people that don't normally fly, like they're, they're tight. They are in it. They are paying attention. And they're frustrated that you are not paying attention. The people that fly a lot, we are not paying. I have my headphones on. I'm already reading a book. I'm checked out. But what she's about to tell you is going to be in a case of an emergency and we lose power. First of all, we ain't losing power 40,000 feet above the ocean. She's like, there'll be emergency lights that light up on the floor. I don't need emergency lights. I need a parachute, lady. <laughs> or if we, lose, if we lose compression, there'll be an oxygen mask that drops out of the ceiling. But don't panic, right? Don't, we're going to panic. And she goes through the whole thing. But she starts saying, and if we need to exit the plane, these are the exit doors. Right? So what they're preparing you for is if you need an escape, you can find a way to escape. Now, that, that's cool when, when in an emergency But many of us are ingrained, either we were brought up by our families or life just taught us to always have a pre-life exit plan. What I'm saying is maybe it's not an airplane that you're on. Maybe it's your marriage and you're already thinking of the exit routes of your marriage. Like if it gets a little turbulence, then I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to find the, the next exit route. Or, or maybe it's in your career. Well, if they give me a hard time, I already have an exit or plan B, or maybe for you when you start trying to walk with Jesus, if it doesn't go the way you want it to go, you have an old lifestyle that's your exit plan from, I'm trying to connect with this family and follow Jesus, but that didn't work out, then I have these old friends I can go back to. And a lot of us have these exit strategies that are in our, in our life. And what happens when you have an exit strategy, you are not committed to the direction you're actually going. In your marriage, if you already have an exit strategy, you're not actually committed to your marriage at all. If you're walking with Jesus and you already have an exit strategy, you're not actually committed to Jesus at all. And we live with these exit strategies. In 1519, we've heard the term burn the ships. Hernan Cortez was a Spanish conquistador, and his job was to conquer part of the, the Mayan empire. And they were stationed in Cuba, and the Spanish king already told Cortez, listen, you need to go from Cuba into Mexico, but you cannot come back unless you conquer. If you don't conquer and you come back, you're going to jail. 
So his men didn't know that, so he goes to Mexico, but his men were already thinking about an escape plan to go back to Cuba where it was safer. And so in his plan, in order to not lose the promise or the, the conquest or the mission in front of him, here's what he did. He actually burned the ships down so his men could not escape to go back to Cuba. And so when there is no escape route, you are completely committed to the mission you're assigned to. When there is no escape route in your marriage, you are completely committed to the marriage you're in. When there is no escape route in walking with Jesus, a little bit of suffering, a little bit of persecution will not make a difference because you have nowhere else to go. The disciples, even Jesus says, if you don't eat my flesh or drink my blood, you're not worthy of walking with me. And a multitude of people left him. He looks at the disciples and said, are y'all going to go too? And they said, where else can we go? How could they say that? They'd already burnt the ship of their old life. They had nowhere else to go. And I think we live in a culture where instead of burning the ships, we keep building new ships to escape every single difficult season, every single difficult moment, every single turbulent moment of our lives. We're always trying to find an exit route. When you come in this room, you're looking for an exit route. When you walk with Jesus, you're looking for an exit route. I'm here to help you. There is no blessing in looking for the exit. There's only a blessing and following Jesus to wherever he takes you. And so what I'm going to walk through today is one of the biblical ways. We're going to unpack this the next few months, or the next month and a half, but to unpack the the main way that Jesus gives us to literally burn the ships, and it's Colossians chapter 2. It says this. I'm reading from the NLT today just because I like one of the words. For you are buried with Christ when you were baptized, and with him you were raised to new life because you what? You trusted the mighty power of God who raised Christ from the dead. This is the gospel that, that you're buried with Christ. Your repentance is you're buried, you die to self. It's not live your best life. Now it's you die to yourself. It's not you dress up your image and you try to live a better life. You die to your life. And then you're raised with Jesus How? By trusting in the mighty power and love of God who even raised Jesus from the dead. Then when I trust him, he's going to raise me to eternal life. It's interesting because he's talking about baptism. Baptism is a word that many of us know, many of us have heard our entire lives that, you know, you go to church, you get baptized. Maybe you come from a a, a more liturgical church when you're a baby, you get baptized. We've heard the word over and over again. This word here is different. This word here has meaning to it. It has a word with power in it. It's not just a ceremony saying there's power, mighty power of God. When you trust in that power, then there's a raising, a dying and a raising up. But I study a lot of Middle Eastern churches. I feel like the church in the Middle East, especially in Arabic Muslim countries, is probably the purest form of church we have in the entire world. It's not tainted with consumerism or self-help. It's not tainted with, with politics. It's people who are literally leaving a community, a family, and a lifestyle to follow Jesus with everything they have. And what's interesting about it is they don't persecute Muslims in the Middle East for reading the Bible. They don't even persecute them for hanging out with other Christians. They don't persecute them for even listening to worship music. They don't persecute them for even going to church. They don't begin to persecute Muslims who are affiliated with Christianity until they get baptized. And the reason for that is they feel like baptism is the point of no return, where you exit one life and enter into a new life. They believe it's the entrance point into the kingdom of God, that you're leaving Islam altogether and walking into something New. It is the point of no return. And the, the reason I find that peculiar is because in Christianity in America, we don't see baptism as a point of no return. We see it as a ceremony to appease our mom or dad or our grandparents. We don't see it as this point of once you get baptized, you're, you're not ever coming back to this old style of life. We don't see it as this entering point into the kingdom of heaven. We see it as this religious occasion that we add to our existing life instead of this line of demarcation that shows something died and something is new. This line or point of no return, this line in the sand of something old and something new has been born. It's completely opposite. And so to understand, I know everybody in this room has heard the word baptism. We need to understand what is baptism. 
What, what is baptism? Watch Monique said it this way. He said, baptism is an outward expression of an inward faith. It means something on the inside has happened to me. Something has changed. I've been born again. I, I've repented. I've been saved. I've died to myself. I'm now born again as a new creation in Christ. And I give an outward expression of that so people can see what God is doing on the inside of me. It's the initial step of obedience in walking with Jesus. We, we talk about this all the time. Even our new believers, we give them a book about following Jesus. Baptism is literally the first step in learning to follow him. And probably the easiest step in following him. And even, this is how crazy we are as Christians. We can take something as simple as this. Baptism is an outward expression of inward faith. And we will fight and build denominations over that. Well, yes, baptism but what is baptism is it for babies or adults is it with sprinkling or with immersion like what and we will build castles around fighting over the entry point into christianity and it's amazing people will say pastor i was sprinkled as a child do i need to get baptized probably yes because that's not baptism the word baptizo which is in the greek is a verb it's a verb. It means to immerse or to dunk. So if two kids were, were playing in the pool, we would say, I'm going to dunk you. If you keep playing, I'm going to dunk you. They would say in Greek, I'm going to baptize you. Can you imagine your kids, you go outside, they're fighting and they're baptizing each other. Praise God. Finally, some good fighting. <laughs> right? If they were taking a, a garment to make a white garment to dye it red, you would baptize the garment in red dye. It, it's a word immersion. And the reason that's important is baptism is reflection of you going into the grave and coming back out of the grave. Same thing with the word die. If you're dying, you're going into the grave one color. You're stained with dirt and sin and grime and shame. But you're coming out white as snow. You're going in dirty and filthy, but you're coming out washed and clean. You don't get that from a little bit of sprinkling. You don't have the feeling of going under and holding your breath and coming out and expressing this amazing deep breath of fresh air as a new believer in Christ. And what happens is when you change the, the method of baptism, you actually change the meaning of baptism. So if you, if you take it and you make it sprinkling, what happens is you've changed the meaning. Now you've put the power onto the person sprinkling you with water or the water itself. You realize, you realize when people sprinkle with water, they don't just use any water. It's holy water. So they're trying to make the water to be the magic instead of the repentance being the magic. And so to change the method actually changed the meaning of baptism. He said, well, Pastor, you know, do you have to be baptized to be saved? And the answer is no, but maybe. Why would you say that in first? Peter 3 says this, the church of Christ loved the scripture. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience or a clean conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It actually says baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you. But in the Greek, it actually translates, is now saving you in the current present tense. And what's interesting with this is, is there's two ways of kind of looking at this. One, people say, well, baptism doesn't save me, therefore it's not that big of a deal. Right? That's one. That's, a, that's an error. Or the second one is, baptism saves you, therefore everybody, the moment they make a decision, they did get baptized, that's an error as well. If Ephesians 2 says, we are not saved by works. For if we were, people could boast. And what happens when you think a work, baptism is, if you think something you do saves you, you miss the whole point of the gospel. Because Jesus finished all the works for you. And salvation is trusting in his finished work for your salvation. If baptism saves you, I could brag. Because I made a decision to get baptized. I got baptized. Or the pastor could brag because he baptized you. And what happens is baptism is an evidence of salvation, but it's not a condition of salvation. It's not, it doesn't mean that if you don't get baptized, you're not going to heaven because the thief on the cross never touched the water, yet he was with Jesus in paradise. Two, 
There was baptisms throughout the scripture. People will argue this all the time, and because church people, we just argue. There are seven different baptisms mentioned in the New Testament alone. Seven different baptisms. And before those seven baptisms are mentioned in the New Testament, there are ritual washings in the Old Testament and the baptism of John, which is a washing or ritualistic washing, meaning there was people being baptized before salvation. So if they get baptized before salvation, that means baptism could not save them. Because if it could, then we didn't need Jesus to begin with. And so I'm here to tell you that is baptism a big deal? Yes. Is it your salvation? No. But if you're not willing to get baptized, one little small step that everybody in the church will celebrate, that your mama, your daddy, your grandmama, your grandfather, even your enemies will celebrate you getting baptized. If you're not willing to take that one little step of obedience, can he really trust you to obey him in anything? In anything? Probably not. And so here, here's what I want to help you learn today. I want you to understand the power that's in baptism that cuts the ties from your past so you can walk in your future, that burns the ships of your former life so you can walk in the promises of God in your new life. And there, there's four, I believe, power we see in the New Testament. And the first one is this, the power of appeal. The power of appeal, meaning when you get baptized, there's an appeal. You're publicly declaring your repentance. When people come to the water and they get baptized, they are publicly saying, I repent of my sin, my shame, my guilt, my past life, my fear. I'm letting everybody know I repent. And it's also an appeal to God for what? A clear conscience. Notice it doesn't say an appeal to my mama and daddy for a good conscience. And if we were honest, I've done baptisms enough over the last 15 years, almost 20 years now, that when I see people get baptized, a majority of them are not making an appeal to God. They're making an appeal to themselves. They want to feel better about their guilt, their self-guilt. They want to appease mama and daddy because they got caught with a DUI and they're trying to help get mama and daddy help them with bond money. And so they're appealing to man Mama, daddy, or my wife, because she's mad at me right now, so if I get baptized, she'll think I'm doing a little bit better. I'm appealing to her for a good conscience and a fresh start. Listen, those people cannot help you. Your sin is eternal. It's internal. You need to appeal to God for a clear conscience. And your baptism is nothing more than publicly, publicly declaring that, God, I need you to forgive me because you're the only one that can clear my conscience. You are the only one that can clean my slate. You are the only one. Even on the day of Pentecost, when Peter was preaching, instead he said to them, repent and be baptized. You cannot separate baptism from repentance. Which means when you get baptized, which is the initial step of obedience, there should be a radical change in your life. If I'm truly repenting, there should be a difference between before I went in the water and when I came out of the water. If there's not a change in your lifestyle, you didn't actually repent. Repentance is metanoia in the Greek, which means a change of mindset. Meaning I'm changing the way I see my sin from fun to filthy. I'm changing the way I see sin from shameful, shameful sin to now I can walk in the cleanliness and purity and the righteousness of God. Something dramatically should happen if you repent. If there wasn't a radical change... When you got baptized, you didn't publicly appeal. You didn't publicly repent. All you did was get wet in, a whole, in front of a whole bunch of people. There's nothing magical about the water. You could say, well, it's holy water. No, it comes from the hose pipe and our janitor's closet. <laughs> yeah, pastor, I got baptized in the Catholic church. Let me help you. There ain't much that's holy in the Catholic church. The only, all the difference between holy water and regular water is somebody they make as a high church official, a priest, a father, a a reverend, somebody prayed over the water. Let me help you. It's still water. It's not magical. The power is not in the water. The power is in repentance. In a day and age where we don't, we tell people, you're, you're just good the way you are. No, you're not. Do you realize the message Jesus preached was repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. The message Peter preaches is repent 
and be baptized. Why? Because the promise is here. And so that's not a, that's not a judgmental message. That's a message of, I don't want you to miss out what God wants to do for you. And I want you to change the way you see life so you can have eternal, abundant life in him. There's a power in the appeal. There's also power in obedience. Obedience. It's the first step of obedience. Baptism is the first step of many in following in the footsteps of Jesus. You did not get saved just to say you're saved. Getting saved is not a ticket that you get out of hell and you get into heaven. How do you get to heaven? By trusting in Jesus and following Jesus who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. How do I find my way to heaven? By walking with Jesus from here all the way to heaven. He's the only one that knows the way. He's the only one that knows where. I ask you, do you know where heaven's at? Do you have the address? Can you tell? Well, I think it's up in the sky. I doubt it's up in the sky. We'll find out tomorrow when the eclipse happens. We'll be able to see really well. <laughs> where, is, where is heaven? Nobody knows. Even Jesus telling the disciples, says, I go to prepare a place for you. Like, where is it? And he says, I can't show you. I can only lead you there. And I'm preparing a place for you when you get there. See, it's, it's obedience. There's something about the first step that determines the rest of the trajectory. And what happens is we have a whole lot of people that the first step is not an obedience step. The first step is a selfish step. They get saved. So, well, Jesus, I just want you to show, you, show me my purpose for my life. You realize no New Testament believer ever said, Jesus, I want to get saved because I, I just need a purpose for my life. You know what their purpose was? Death. Martyrdom. Persecution. Suffering. It's amazing when you read the New Testament, especially the book of Acts. The message we preach for salvation is if you want your life to get better, just say yes to Jesus. If you want to find your purpose, just follow Jesus. Say yes to Jesus. Do you realize in the New Testament church, here was the message. Hey, Jesus is really mad because y'all killed him. He's coming back. And when he comes back, he's not going to come like he did the first time. He's coming as a warrior on a white horse to set up his kingdom on earth. And his enemies will be scattered and sent away. But any of you who want to be part of that kingdom to come, I'm giving you a chance now to repent of this kingdom and come underneath my rule and my authority and reign with me when that day comes. But in the meantime, you're probably going to lose your family, your job, maybe your life. You're going to be persecuted. You're going to suffer, all these things. And they still said yes. Why? Because this is the step of obedience. When I get saved, I'm not just saying yes to the first step. I'm saying yes to every single step he places in my way. Matthew 28, 18, 19, 20, which we use as the Great Commission. He said, this is the commandment. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And teaching them to what? Obey. This is like teaching them doctrine, teaching them politics. It says teaching them to obey what? All that Jesus commanded them. Baptism is this step of obedience. And when you step into obedience, it changes the game. It changes everything. See, because disobedience, disobedience unlocks the door for the enemy. I don't know, I don't know if you all know this or not. This, this is a key principle that I, I've lived my life by. Disobedience unlocks the door that allows Satan to enter and influence your life and environment. When you disobey God's way of life, sexuality, love, finances, whatever area it is you disobey God in, when you disobey him in that area, it actually unlocks a door that now Satan comes in that area and influences you even more than you thought he could. Case in point, example. If you disobey God in the covenant with your marriage, whether through being lustful, whatever it may be, what happens is as soon as you unlock that door, he sets up shop in your marriage and begins to influence you in every single way where you will now reject your spouse or hate your spouse, not because they did anything, because the enemy is influencing your mind. But the opposite, obedience locks the door to the enemy and empowers the Holy Spirit to influence you and your environment. Like there's power in obedience. And we, we, we look at obedience as a bad word. No, obedience is a blessing word. We tell our kids, like, my love is unconditional. My, my, for my kids, my love, no matter what they do, unless they went to Auburn. Like, oh, like I love my kids. There's nothing they can do to change my love for them. 
But my blessings are contingent upon their obedience. With God, his love is unconditional. He loves you regardless of what you've done, what you could do, what sin you've been in, how bad you've been. How good. He loves you unconditionally. He loves everybody unconditionally, sinner and saint. But his blessings flow through obedience. You even see with Jesus, Jesus goes into the wilderness. He's tempted for 40 days and 40 nights while he's fasting. And the enemy, enemy tempts him in three specific areas. As he tempts him in those three areas, what he's actually trying to get Jesus to do is to be his own king and his own ruler and not submit to the Father. For 40 days and 40 nights, he gets him. You know, if, if, if you're really, really king, you can have all of this. If you just submit to me, you can have all these kingdoms. If you throw yourself off this pinnacle, then the angels will say, and he keeps tempting him at what? To pick up his own authority and rule over his own life. He rejects it. He resists the enemy. He comes right out of the 40 days of temptation, right to John and says, now it's time to be baptized. Why is that important? Because it was his first step of obedience. Another way to say that is this. All of us have some flag or banner flying over our lives. While Jesus was in the wilderness, it was a battle for obedience and surrender. The enemy was actually tempting him to pick up the same exact things the Father already promised Jesus. The only difference was the enemy was tempting him to raise up his own banner to rule and reign over himself. Some of us have a banner of selfishness. Some of us have a banner of sexuality. Some of us have a banner of anger. Some of us have a banner of sin. Some of us have a banner of our purpose. Some of us have a banner of our careers. Some of us have a banner of our family. We have something that raises over us, that leads us, and we follow that banner wherever it may lead us. Jesus comes out of the wilderness refusing to pick up his own banner. And when he gets baptized, every single one of us, when we get baptized, it's like we bring up the banner that Jesus is now king of my life. I'm obeying him and I've surrendered to his rule and reign as king over my life. So this is the first step of many steps of walking, carrying the flag that Jesus is my king. And the problem with our culture is we want to carry multiple flags. We want to carry up an American flag, Pride flag, roll tide flag. There's only one flag on the flagpole of your heart. And that flagpole determines how you live, what you do, how you behave, how you think, and what you're surrendered to. And obedience is the key to locking or unlocking everything else. Number three is the power of identity. Power of identity. When you get baptized, you're literally reminding yourself that you're not who you used to be. When you get baptized, you're reminding yourself that you are a new creation in Jesus Christ. Not just when you get baptized, but when you watch baptisms next Sunday and you see other people, you're reminding yourself that you are a new image in Christ. You are a new creation in Christ. You are not the old you. You are new. 2 Corinthians 15 says it this way. Or five. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. When you get baptized, the water washes over you and you come out. You're fresh, you're clean. In the words of the prophet outcast, you're fresh and clean. And most of us need to be reminded of that more often than we think. Because you have an enemy who tells you you're not that person. You're actually who you used to be. And baptism is this line in the sand where you preach the gospel to yourself in a tangible way. It's a line of demarcation that when you get baptized, you can tell the enemy, I am not who you're telling me I am because that person is still in the water. When you get baptized, some things should stay in the water and not come back out, which means your old identity should stay in the water. Like for me, some of y'all know my story, some don't. My... my, my nickname, I talked to a buddy of mine two weeks ago. My nickname was BG, which stood for Bobby Gorley and also Baby Gangster. Take that what you want. <laughs> like, I did bad stuff. I didn't just live a party. Like, I did bad stuff. And I was known for what I had done that was bad. And my nickname went along with that. When I got saved and baptized, that nickname didn't come back out of the water with me. 
that nickname doesn't go with me anymore. That identity doesn't go with me anymore. And when you get baptized, there should be a change of identity that you are not who you were grown up to be. You are who Jesus died to make you to be. And baptism tells that story over and over and over again and reminds you of that fact. It's not, it's not a faith thing. It's a fact thing. Do you realize that almost every single person in the Old Testament and a majority of the New Testament, when they encountered Jesus and they were born again, their name actually changed? Why? Because their identity was different. They're not known by what they did. They're known for who they are and what they're going to be. And for you, the same way when you get baptized, it changes who you are. You need to remind yourself of that in many ways. And by identifying with Jesus and his death, now I get to identify with him in his new life. The problem with it is you don't get to identify with his resurrection if you don't identify with his death. And I would say, especially coming out of Easter, a majority of us have too much association with the resurrection of Jesus and not enough identification with the death of Jesus. So what are you saying, Pastor? I'm saying we all want the promise on the other side of the cross, but none of us want the cross. The cross is, what Shemini said, the, the cross is where the sinner dies. That the blood deals with the sin, but the cross deals with the sinner. And when the sinner dies, the only thing that comes out of the water, that comes out of the new birth, is the saint. And that's the identity we have. Another person said this way, when we get baptized, we wash away our sandcastle so that God can establish his kingdom in us. And number four is this, the power of testimony. When you get baptized, it's a testimony of your love and devotion to Jesus. Okay. Almost every time I do a baptism, I was walk, uh, talking to Phil Wigginton, who's doing his grandson's uh, wedding. He said, well, how do you do a wedding? So I gave him this little template. I said, but I always equate it to like this. Like, when you get baptized, you can get baptized anywhere you want to, right? You can get baptized in the church, at the creek, at the ocean. You can get baptized in California, like in the movie Jesus Revolution. Same thing with a, with a wedding. You can get married anywhere. You can get married in the church. Married at the courthouse, you get married outside in Alabama, you get married in a barn in the middle of summer when it's 180 degrees, like you get married wherever you want to. But you usually want people around that you love. Why? Because you want them to know how much you love this woman or how much you love this man. You want them to see that you're giving yourself, and I'll explain to you that when two, a husband and a wife, a biblical marriage, are in a covenant, they come together, they become one in Christ. Which means there's a new identity that is no longer I and me, it's now we. That which I used to be, I used to be a bachelor, used to be a bachelorette, that's gone away with, there's something new that's been formed. And you want everybody to know how much you love this person. So you have this whole ceremony just to show people how much you love this person. Same thing with baptism, you can get baptized anywhere. But you usually want people that you love around to be witnesses of how much you love Jesus. That now him and I are coming together. It's no longer I and me. It's now we. The old has passed away. Now this new life begins at baptism. It, it's literally a wedding. It, it's almost like your wedding band when you walk around. It, it used to be real suspicious of people that don't wear their wedding band. Right? In the same way, you should be real suspicious of people that don't, that say they follow Jesus, but don't talk about Jesus. You should be real suspicious of people who want to be saved by Jesus or want a relationship with Jesus, but are too private to actually have a ceremony to show the world how much they love Jesus. And it's a testimony. There, there's a book by, uh, I can't say which country he's in, but he was a missionary in a foreign country, wrote it in a commentary on 1 Peter. It tells a story, there's this young woman named Miriam who was Muslim, right? Her family was Muslim, she was Muslim, and she built a relationship with them, she'd come over to the house, eat dinner, and she started falling in love with Jesus. And she made a decision to follow Jesus, and she wanted to get baptized the following Easter, which was in a couple weeks. Really, obviously, with Islam, that's the entry point into Christianity. They were scared to death, and they didn't want to just baptize her with her mom. She was a minor. She was 14 years old. And so they brought the mom over for dinner, and they had dinner, and it was great. They knew the mom and had dinner, and, and they said, hey, like, they slid this piece of paper across the table. And it was basically a permission slip to baptize her daughter, Miriam. And she looked at it, and without even thinking, she signs it and slides it back over. They don't think much of it. Easter's coming up in a couple weeks. 
she shows up to witness her daughter's baptism into Christianity. And as she was witnessing it, she had went home after she signed that piece of paper and read through the Gospel of John. And her mom got baptized the same Sunday as Miriam did. Why? There's power in a testimony. Revelation 19, we know that we overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. What is your testimony? It's not your story. It's God's story he's inviting you into. And he invites you in this story. And our baptism is nothing more than say, look at this story of how good God has been to me. We use the words, I was but God. I was broken. I was anxious. I was a thief. I was an adulterer. I was promiscuous. I was selfish. I was whatever it may be. But God, Ephesians 2, rich in mercy, showed up in my life. And when he showed up, he took the scales off my eyes so I could see the gospel was the salvation for all and unto all men for me. And I repented of my sin and I trusted in him. Now I am. Made new. I am full of peace. I am full of joy. I am set apart. I am chosen. I am the holy priesthood. I am the head. I am not the tail. I am rich in glorious heavenly inheritance. I am who he made me to be. Like that's the testimony. And people need to know your testimony. In a day and age, listen, where people don't trust preachers in the pulpit for good reasons. They question everything I say, even if it's Scripture and I'm just reading the Scripture, they'll question it. But when they see you and they see who you used to be and they see who you are now, they're going to have a question, what happened? You can say, well, I did this. No, no, here's what happened, but God. I had a down spot in my life. I had a moment I didn't know which way to turn. My family left me. My wife left me. My kids left me. My dog won't even look at me. Nobody loved me anymore. And I found myself all alone. And I opened up the scripture and I read John 3 that Jesus did not come to condemn me. He came to save me. And when he saved me, I didn't have anything to offer him or anything to give. He took me with nothing and he's given me a new life. He's given me a new outlook. He's given me a new perspective. My wife came back. My kids came back. And my dog likes me again. Everything changed. It's your story. They can't argue the story. They can argue evolution. They can argue <laughs> eclipses and earthquakes and baptism doctrines. They can, we, people can debate and argue anything, but they can't and debate and argue your encounter with the living God. And one of the things that's happened to the church, we've depended, for, for good reason, the word is the word. We've depended on the Bible for evangelism. And the Bible is a great tool for evangelism, but your story goes hand in hand with the Bible. If in heaven, they're still writing in the book of life. Your story is somewhere written down as part of God's word to somebody to see that he is still alive and well today. Baptism is powerful. It's powerful. I would tell you when you do get baptized, invite everybody you know. Invite everybody. They need to see your devotion and love to Jesus because they need to see his love and devotion to you. He said, well, Pastor, do I need, when do I get baptized? And, and this is the big one in, in the Bible Belt. When do we get baptized? I hear this all. Well, Pastor, you know, we don't do baptism every single week. Or, hey, do you got to get baptized as soon as you believe? Or should you wait and do a class first? There's, there's lots of objections. Here, here's one of them. One, uh, people say, well, I just don't feel ready to get baptized yet. I want to get close to the Lord first. You know, that, that's honorable. But you don't grow close to the Lord, then obey him. You obey him, then you grow close to the Lord. Objection two I hear a lot is, I don't feel worthy. I want to get some things right first. I would tell you that step of obedience actually unlocks the door. For the Holy Spirit to come in and help you become more obedient and feel more worthy. Objection three, I need to have a better understanding or more knowledge about the Bible or baptism. First, I need a class, which may not be a bad thing. But nowhere in the New Testament on the day of Pentecost we see where there are 3,000 people get baptized. We don't see any class for them to get baptized first. Objection number four, I want to have my family here first. Good thing, but delayed obedience is still disobedience. And some of the scriptures that I'll, I'll share with people in this is this. 
Peter stood up, repent, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. You will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, for the promises for you and for your children, and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord God calls to himself. And with many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, save yourselves from this crooked generation, which I would say that is prophetic to this day and age. So those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. Philip and the eunuch in Acts 8, he shares the gospel with him. He sees water, says, what prevents me from being baptized? Right? Neither one is wrong. Do you have to delay baptism or immediate baptism? No, it's just obedience. So you can walk in the power of what God has for you. He said, well, am I ready? Here's the three words, that, the questions I ask. Question number one, do you believe that Jesus is God's anointed king, the one who was promised through the scriptures, that Jesus died for our sins and rose from the dead and he will return? Do you believe that? That's, that's the gospel. Two, salvation. Do you trust Jesus as Lord and Savior? Believing he has done everything necessary to save you. But three, there's a lordship question because he's not just Savior, he's also Lord. And are you committed to following Jesus no matter the cost, without conditions or excuses for the rest of your entire life? If you answer yes to all three of those, you are a great candidate for baptism. And I will tell you, the power of baptism is waiting for you to be obedient. So, Pastor, why are, you, why are you saying this? It's because one of, I feel like my callings and our calling as a church is, is to break down the religious junk around the gospel and around Jesus. And one of the biggest obstacles or junk around the gospel is the doctrine of baptism. So many arguments over it, so many, well, you know, this, this. It's just, a, it's a powerful expression of what God is doing on the inside of you to get it out of you, one, so people can see, but two, other people can know your story so that way it's preaching the gospel to them so then begins to multiply and becomes this beautiful entrance into the kingdom of heaven to break away from your old life or burn the ships of your old life to walk in your new life. If you would bow your heads and close your eyes just for one quick second. first before we even ask a question. Next week is baptism. We already have numerous people signed up for baptism. We're going to spend the whole Sunday just celebrating the gospel through the stories of people right here in this church, maybe even sitting right next to you that God has been doing miracles in, in this church. But some of you, maybe you need to actually take that step of obedience. Say, Pastor, I was baptized as a kid. Yeah, but were you changed when you got baptized? If not, you didn't repent and were baptized. It may be time to repent and be baptized. Pastor, I was sprinkled. Yeah, then it may be time to be immersed. Pastor, I don't know if I'm, I'm ready yet. I would tell you, when are you going to be ready? And Pastor Jason will talk in just a second about just some of those steps. The second question is this. Some of you, there's a different banner flying over your life than Jesus is king. For some of you, being strictly transparent, some of you, it's a rainbow flag that you're flying over your life. Your identity, your hope, your salvation is in it. For some of you, it's an American flag. You're flying it over your hope, your emotions, your salvation, your identity is wrapped up underneath that banner. For some of you, Maybe it's a banner of self that it's wrapped up in living your best life, trying to improve yourself. It's flying. There's only one banner that brings salvation. There's only one banner that brings hope. There's only one banner that brings peace. There's only one banner that brings joy. And that's the banner of Jesus as king in your life. It comes through surrender. It comes from burning all other banners and trusting in him that when he said it is finished, it was finished. I'm going to have you stand up today. I'm not going to have you make a response to that. Here's what I'm going to tell you. If you've been living your life under a different banner, you need to publicly repent by burying that stuff in the old you so that you can be resurrected in Christ with a new banner. If that's you, I would tell you baptism is a great step to wash away the sandcastles of your life, to begin to surrender to the rule and reign of Jesus as king in your life. Father, we bless you in this place. We thank you for your mercies that are in you every single day. 
We thank you for your grace that is sufficient. We thank you for the power of the gospel. That in the midst of our weaknesses and our failures and our rebellion, you still are the saving king who redeem us from every single evil work we've committed against you. That you save us by the blood of your son, Jesus, by the finished work of the cross, by the power of the resurrection. So Father, right now we trust in you, we surrender to you, we ask that you have your kingdom come in us as it is in heaven. In the mighty name of Jesus and all God's people said.